Hello everybody and welcome to Phys Ed Summit 3.0. Thank you so much for joining us for this huge physical education and health global conference. So we could not make this happen without your participation and I just want to personally thank each and every one of you for helping spread the word um, to all your colleagues out there in the physical education and health world. We, we really appreciate it. By sharing the conference with just one person, you can, you can impact the lives of all your students, so, and many of their students as well. So we're very thankful for that. Um, just a reminder that during the conference and during this session, there might be some te technical difficulties as we're using technology. However, if there is any kind of technical difficulties, we'll take care of you as fast as we can. And if you're using the tozzle, you can simply push refresh and hopefully that'll fix things for you. After the Phys Ed Summit, we will post a feedback survey um, on the Phys Ed Summit 3.0 homepage, which we would really love for you to fill out. Once you fill out this survey, you'll receive a certificate um, that marks how many hours of professional development that you participated in during the Phys Ed Summit. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our next presenter, whose name is Dr. Steve Jeffries. Dr. Steve Jeffries is a professor at Central Washington University, as well as the Shape America president. And Steve, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to everybody today, and everyone enjoy. 50 million strong by 2029. What's your number? Greetings, this is Steve Jeffries, and I live just north of Seattle in Washington State on a tiny island in the Puget Sound. I'm originally from England, but I've taught the last 29 years at Central Washington University. And this year, I'm the president of Shape America. Today, I wanna to share information about Shape America's vision for a nation in which all school-aged students are physically active and healthy. We're calling this 50 million strong. Before I tell you more about it, I want to pose a question for you to think about during my presentation. As a health or physical educator, where are you going with your teaching and how will you know when you've arrived? Ken Robinson in one of his wonderful TED Talks points out that there's a big difference between doing and achieving. As an example, many people claim to be dieting, but far fewer are actually losing weight. All of us do a lot of teaching, but what are our students really learning? To me, this highlights the value of all of us during this year's Phys Ed Summit, taking time to think hard about what we are doing in our professional lives. Shape America's 50 million strong goal encourages all of us to look ahead, to set a target that we can plan to achieve 14 years from now when this year's entering kindergartners will graduate high school. Now, all of us, of course, do some daydreaming about the future. Each one of us has dreams about what we would like for ourselves, our children, and maybe our grandchildren. And most of us are even doing more than just dreaming. We're setting aside investments to help us to be able to achieve these dreams. But we also know that thinking about and looking ahead into the future is a very uncertain process. Several years ago, former Sec US Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, clarified how to think about the future when he told us there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Pretty helpful, huh? Well, actually, people are still debating whether this was a brilliant or dumb comment. It takes a bit of thinking, but actually Rumsfeld's suggestion does make sense. For example, we all know that as we age, our health will deteriorate, a known known. We also know that things happen to a person's health that are unexpected, known unknowns. And finally, there are changes that are going to affect our lives that right now we know nothing about. Think about the recent Ebola disease. If we'd known about it, we would have planned ahead, but we had no idea. It was an unknown unknown. Makes you pause and think, doesn't it? Certainly does me. And reading about and reflecting upon the future is something that's intrigued me for many years. We all know that we live in a fast changing world, but sometimes I don't think 
we fully appreciate how fast. On this slide are some highlights of how the world looked just 40 years ago. 1978, much of what we think about today didn't exist. Since then, the world population has almost doubled and technology has transformed our lives. Microsoft and Apple were just getting started and Facebook creator Mark Zuckerberg was still nine years away from being born. Things are constantly changing. You just don't have to look very far for examples of businesses that failed to see change coming and were unable or refused to adapt. Today we can add Kodak to this list, perhaps the Olive Garden, and most likely in a few years, Kmart and Sears. Interestingly, the phrase Kodak moment has taken on a new meaning from the way that many of us are used to thinking about it. Instead of a cue that we're, it's a good time for somebody to take a picture, it's used to illustrate the failure of a company to recognize quickly enough how the world was fast changing. Similarly, there have been many people in many careers who over the years thought their jobs were secure, not realizing that what they were doing would shortly no longer be necessary in the world in which they lived. It wasn't that they were doing a lousy job. They simply didn't anticipate change and how it would affect them. They were too focused on what they were doing, probably trying to do it well, but not looking around them. Maybe this sounds familiar. Now you might be thinking, well, that's interesting, but not really important to what I do professionally. After all, it's pretty clear that by design, humans were intended to move. Our bones, muscles, heart, and brain depend on movement and healthy living to survive. So our jobs as health and physical education teachers are pretty secure, aren't they? <clears throat> but are they really? Well, I suggest they may not be as secure as we'd like to think. Over the past few years, there have been incredible developments in science, medicine, engineering, and technology that have changed the world in which we live. And as we all know, there is mounting pressure for public education to change in order to better prepare children to succeed. I want to suggest to you that it's pretty naive to believe that our lives as health and physical educators can continue unchanged in a rapidly changing world. And if you, like me, share some concerns about how we will fare in the future, I'd also suggest there are ways to address change more likely to be successful than others. Here are a couple of quotes that I think are helpful for us when thinking about the future. The first of these by Neil Postman emphasizes that what happens to us in the future is very much going to be determined by what we do today. In other words, today we're sowing the seeds for our future. The second quote, which has been attributed to many people, including Abraham Lincoln, again emphasizes our personal responsibility for what happens to us in the future. We mustn't just let the future happen to us. So what does this information I've shared about the future mean? What I'd suggest is that what all of us need to do when thinking about our own personal lives or our professional lives is to look ahead and to plan steps that will take us where we want to go. So perhaps you're thinking, how do we begin? <clears throat> a good starting point when thinking about the future is to think about the past, what's worked and what hasn't. Understanding what's happened to us in the past helps us prepare for the future. It's a bit similar to fly fishing, where you succeed if your preparation, called backcasting, determines whether or not you land the fly close enough to the fish. Tom Templin, one of our colleagues from Purdue University, added to this suggestion some years ago by pointing out that when thinking about the future, we also need to spend some time looking back from the past. We must examine the present carefully, glance back in the past as if peering into a rearview mirror of a car, and then move forward into the future with the hope that the route we take will in fact improve public schools teachers, and the students they serve. So let's briefly do this. Our profession has traveled an incredible journey. Shape America began 130 years ago. 
Very few organizations or companies can claim that longevity. America's Civil War had only ended 20 years earlier, which means that many of our first professional members were alive during this war. The telephone had only been invented nine years earlier. It would be almost 20 years before the world would see the first manned airplane flight, and it was about this time that Carl Benz invented what many regard as the first automobile. It was in this world that William Anderson, a 30-year-old medically trained physical activity instructor, got together about 60 people in Brooklyn, New York, to discuss physical education. Everyone in the room got a chance to speak, and among them was a man called Dudley Sargent, who suggested that the profession needed to answer three key questions. Questions that are perhaps just as pertinent to all of us today as we think about our professional futures as they were 130 years ago. You'll notice I've taken the liberty <clears throat> to add one more question pertinent in today's technological environment. But what I want to point out to you is that unfortunately, over the past 130 years, we still struggle as a profession to be able to clearly identify what we do. This quote from 1922 illustrates the confusion. Today, we're still debating whether we're trying to change students' bodies or their minds. Now, I get it, we wanna do both, but truly, can we? Surely there's a difference between what we would like to do and what we're capable of doing. In 1985, a physical educator called Cheryl Hoffman wrote an essay entitled The Decline and Fall of Physical Education. In it, he described the closure of the last public school PE program. He imagined businesses taking over the running of physical education and there being no need for school physical education teachers. Here's an excerpt. Physical education professionals have been awash in the sea of confusion for years. No two of them can agree on what should be taught. What passes for physical education in any particular school is likely depend on the whims of the teachers. Since its inception, the National Assessment of Educational Progress at Educational Testing Service has omitted physical education from its assessment program because there is no national consensus concerning curriculum content in the school program. We can only imagine what might happen were math, science, and English teachers to follow the same destructive course. And in the same year, John Massengale lamented on the status of physical education in what he pointed out then was a changing world. For years, physical education has lacked the ability to predict, control, or determine its own destiny. It has been manipulated by people from all sectors of American society whenever a fad appeared upon the scene. The field of physical education has been reshaped by women's movements, expelled by educators during economic depression, ignored by educational reformers during their zeal for excellence, abused by television, and exploited by glamorous entertainers. This process of development has been whim, fad, and circumstance. Little of it related to any planned direction or future. Which brings us to today, and the question I asked you to think about earlier. Where are you going professionally, and how will you know if you've successfully arrived? So let's reflect a bit on where we are and what lies ahead for us. Fast forwarding from 1885 to today, what's plainly evident is that there is huge public interest in children's health, and especially their eating and physical activity habits. Have you noticed that physical activity promoting groups are becoming hugely popular and attracting great publicity, or simultaneously physical education continues to struggle? I appreciate it's not everywhere and not everyone, but it's a struggle, isn't it? As a profession, we constantly have to defend our existence 
and be vigilant about threats to our programs and teaching positions. Over the last decade, dozens, or if we include states and cities, probably hundreds of organizations have sprung up to promote healthy and active living and are especially targeting children in our public schools. Which is somewhat puzzling, isn't it? What's wrong with these people? Why don't they see us as a solution to what they're seeking? Well, back in 1992, then Governor Bill Clinton was challenging George Bush for the presidency. His staff were trying to decide how best to appeal to voters, what to target. Healthcare, the recent invasion of Iraq and the recession were all key issues. They decided on three key phrases to focus the campaign. One of which was, it's the economy, stupid. What they tried to do was to create a laser-like focus for everyone involved with Clinton's campaign on what was most important to voters, what voters wanted. The recession and rising unemployment was a hot issue, other things less important. Clinton, of course, went on to win and serve two terms as president of the US, and I think we can learn from this. Let's think about our targeting and messaging in physical education. For 30 or more years, we've worked hard to improve the quality of school physical education instruction. We've created national standards. We've promoted new curriculum models. We've addressed assessment. We've talked about new PE as if it was the solution to old, presumably bad PE. We've got millions in PEP grants, added technology, promoted integration, and still much more, but in far too many places, we don't get no respect. It's pretty strange, isn't it, that physical activity promoting organizations are flourishing while we're still floundering. Why? Well, I want to suggest it's because we stubbornly continue to stick with the same messages in PE while hoping for different results, which, as many of you know, Einstein defined as insanity. So today, I'm suggesting that we need to push the pause button and rethink. It seems to me that the public simply is not interested in what physical educators are trying to sell them. Recognizing and accepting this, then changing is not going to be easy. But again, I'll share with you a couple of examples of what happens when you allow yourself to get out of touch with your customers, and in our case, potential advocates. Some of you may know that in the late 70s and early 80s, videotape and videotape players were invented. What you may not know is that for several years, the Japanese electronic giants, JVC and Sony, fought bitterly and spent millions trying to get their brand of tape and tape players to become the industry standard. Interestingly, Sony was first to create something called Betamax, which by all accounts was superior to JVC's videotape. But in the end, Sony lost the battle and VHS tape became the standard. It turned out that despite the better quality, people didn't like the higher price and critically, it couldn't record the four hours necessary to tape an entire American football game. Betamax, we learned, was a product with great potential, but Sony badly misread what was important to customers. Here's another example of professional misjudgment closer to what we do. If you've ever participated in karate, you'll know it's a great physical activity. It has skills, fitness, flexibility, discipline, fun, and much more. So how come it's not taught in PE? Why is it still a fringe sport taught mostly in dingy gyms to very small audiences? Well, I believe it's because karate instructors are proud of their sport, but somewhat misguided about how best to promote it. They've convinced themselves there is only one way to deliver karate, and that is by using black belted instructors, of which they, of course, ensure there are relatively few. To me, this type of self-serving protectionism has helped them to succeed in protecting a small number of jobs while failing to popularize karate. I'm sharing these examples of Betamax and karate with you because I believe physical educators have for too long persisted in muddled messaging and trying to sell the public a product it does not want. And to make matters worse, our messaging is perceived by many as self-serving because we keep asking for special legislative protection. 
Sticking to this path will, I fear, not help us to succeed and may well be responsible for our future demise and eventual extinction. Fortunately, it simply doesn't have to be this way for physical education, but we have to think differently both about our product and also how to deliver it. I mentioned earlier all of the physical activity promoting organizations. They're thriving as we struggle, and yet we have the one thing they need most, an effective delivery system for physical activity and health promotion to every school-aged child. We have trained professionals who are present, prepared, and I think with some encouragement, motivated to do the work that it's going to take to get America's youth physically active and healthy. The data supports this vision. There's nearly a quarter of a million physical and health education teachers in the US, located and teaching daily in the nation's 100,000 schools. They see pretty much every one of the 50 million children attending our public schools at least once, and probably more each week for about 12 years. Imagine our potential to get America's youth physically active and healthy. Who is better prepared to succeed than us? No one. It wasn't that long ago that Amazon began as a bookstore and at that time chose UPS as its delivery system. When Amazon exploded, deciding to sell pretty much anything, it didn't try to create a new delivery system because UPS was already there and worked. Health and physical education is, I believe, similarly poised to do the work and to deliver what people want. Kids to be more physically active and healthy. If only we can get beyond the box that's currently constraining our thinking and handicapping our chances to succeed. But we are going to have to make some choices in order for us not just to survive, but to achieve the success that we're capable of achieving. And as this slide illustrates, it's something of a choice that has huge consequences for us personally and for our profession. And I don't know how long we have to make this choice. Several years ago, journalist Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called The Tipping Point, in which he pointed out how situations remained unchanged for many years, and then something happened and it had a domino effect. And once the tipping point occurred, there was no going back, no do-overs. Sadly, it's not difficult to imagine something like this occurring in health and physical education. We have in fact already seen in Washington state, a school district replace its physical education teachers with YMCA instructors. What if more schools copied this? What if a major city such as Los Angeles recognized the millions of dollars it could save copying this? Almost instantly, every school district in the country would hear about the change. And then what for us? The good news is that although the need for us to change is urgent, it's not yet too late. So if the course, the question on your lips is, well, okay, what do we need to do? I believe we need to agree upon and then focus on a single clear and valued physical education teaching target. And it's been this thinking that was the impetus for Shape America's newly announced 50 million strong by 2029 goal. It's taken several years, but as Shape America, we're now one unified national professional organization. We've agreed that our focus should be on health education and physical education, which of course also includes dance and sports. But to me, that's not enough. This is what Shape America means by 50 million strong by 2029 getting every student entering our schools this fall to be physically active and healthy by the time they graduate in 2029. Now I need to be absolutely honest here and to point out that this is a hugely profound change for physical educators wherever you teach. As I've tried to explain, as a profession we're suffering primarily because we don't all agree on what we're trying to do. And once again, I hasten to add that all the different things we are doing are not bad, but rather that we need to first and foremost have a very clear and measurable collective target. We saw this approach work back in 1963, when faced with a hostile relationship with the Soviet Union, 
Lagging far behind them in space exploration, President John Kennedy set a bold, audacious and very risky goal for the nation. To put a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth within the decade. As we now know, it didn't take the US a decade to succeed. Similarly, for those of us in physical education, to secure our professional future, we also need to be bold and willing to try for something that we truly can achieve and that the public will respect. 50 million strong by 2029 is health and physical education's 21st century moonshot. And to help our profession move ahead, Shape America is encouraging each and every one of us to do our part to help the profession succeed. But of course, it's rather mind boggling and impersonal for any of us to think about changing the behaviors of 50 million young people. So let's personalize the challenge. Many of you will remember a movie called The Guardian. In it, Kevin Costner played Ben Randall, a legendary Coast Guard rescue swimmer admired for his success saving lives. A new recruit determined to better Randall's achievements repeatedly asks him for his number. How many lives has he saved? Randall avoids responding until close to the movie's end when pressed again for his number, he responds, 22. The rookie lifesaver surprised, surely a rather unimpressive number for a legend. But then Randall explains, 22 is the number of lives I failed to save. If you think about it, we as physical educators are also involved in saving lives. We know that the students we teach in our schools need to stay physically active and healthy both today and tomorrow if they're going to enjoy happy and productive lives. So instead of thinking 50 million, my challenge to each of you is to think specifically of the lives that you can save. Ask yourself, what's my number? Because if we all do this, if we all play our part in this big challenge over the next 14 years, we can indeed create a nation of 50 million strong. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your conference, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions over the next few days.